It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you so you're empowered with knowledge so you can make better financial decisions in your life. How do you decide which items to purchase, which restaurants to visit, which tour you might want to take? Reviews. But how can you tell if you can really trust the reviews you're seeing? I'm going to talk about that. And also in this episode, diamonds. What's the old slogan? Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Well, right now, the price of diamonds is a girl's best friend because the price of diamonds is going down. We're going to talk about that. So I've been talking for probably five years or more about why five stars doesn't mean anything anymore when you see reviews because so many businesses are paying these third-party services to write fake reviews boosting how a business looks to a consumer who's just doing a quick glance at let's say Yelp or TripAdvisor or Google reviews Amazon reviews whatever it is, that this has become a big business to write fake reviews to boost the reputation of a business. There are also, uh, the seamy underbelly of this is where people will pay to have negative reviews posted of a competitor. Now, what's clear to me over the years is that if you read reviews you'll see that the reviews, you can pretty much tell when the reviews are fake. The way they're worded, that's just like the same gobbledygook over and over again. It's generic kind of stuff because the person's never eaten there, never stayed there, never bought that or whatever. And so the ratings that you see, you know, four circles filled or five stars or whatever it is, that doesn't mean anything because of the manipulation that's happening. But there's another thing that I didn't think about that I read in a Wall Street Journal story that people feel bad even after a bad experience giving a business, a hotel, a restaurant, whatever, a low score, even if the circumstance, the experience would call for it. And so after reading the Wall Street Journal story, when I was reading reviews, because I always read reviews instead of look at the overall rating, I was seeing things where somebody would talk about a really bad experience they had, you know, mold or, uh, you know, loud noise or uh, the air conditioning didn't work or whatever. And they'd be giving the hotel a rating of four out of five. And I'm thinking, wow, that's a really, really bad experience, and they're still rating it four out of five. And that was what the Wall Street Journal story was about, is human nature being what it is. We feel bad saying something bad about somebody else, most of us. And oh, the funny thing with the hotel reviews, though, the corporate traveler types who have some kind of status with Marriott and Bonvoy or Hilton and uh, Honors or any of the programs, it's always about the hotel stuff, that if they're not properly recognized at the front desk when they get there because of their status, they give the hotel as low a rating as possible and they just whine and complain and whatever. And I didn't get a choice of cocktails, even though my status is supposed to get it for me. I mean, man, it must be brutally awful to travel for some big company and be away from home. And it mean that much to you to have the uh, crumbs handed to you by Marriott or Hilton or Hyatt or uh, you know, Holiday Inn or whatever, that you get that upset about it. But I'm learning these idiosyncrasies, these patterns. But this is a long way around of saying you cannot decide 
or I can't, can't say cannot. It would be advisable to not choose a business or service based on how many circles are filled in or how many stars. Read the reviews if your money's really at stake so you have a better feel for whether or not it is a place or service or product or whatever that you would want. Krista? By the way, I say you get a full five stars for Aww. the excellent work you do. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I always loved getting a star on my paper in school. It was like a huge deal. Or they put like a rainbow sticker on your – oh, my gosh. That I, see, I was thrill. really happy in school when I didn't get an F. <laughs> that was the difference between the two of us. All right. Uh, first question is from Paul in Missouri. He says, Clark, I listen to your podcast while running. It's my best time to think and hear your good advice. My question revolves around paying for college. I opened two separate Coverdell accounts when my son and daughter were born. I maxed out the $2,000 contribution for the past 14 years, and both accounts now have slightly over $70,000 each. Fantastic. I picked individual stocks and really got lucky on their growth. My kids have three more years of high school before college. I feel I should transfer both into 529 accounts and choose more stable, conservative funds. Do you agree? And if so, what type of low-risk fund should I consider? So, uh, first of all, congratulations, because nobody knows what a Coverdell is. It was named after a, a U.S. Senator, Paul Coverdell, and it was um, really the predecessor to the 529 accounts that are so popular today and kind of died on the vine. So very few people have one, have ever heard of one. You're thinking of, of going from individual stocks that have significant risk to as your kids approach college age, going into more conservative, smart, right thing to do. What I would do is you can move money from a covered L tax-free into a 529 account and I've got a guide at Clark.com, Paul, that walks you through the best of the 529 accounts. And you move the money into what often is called enrollment date or um, age-based portfolio. It will be very conservative as your kids are already sophomores in high school. It'll get steadily more conservative from there by the time they're enrolled in college. And that way, you're basically uh, taking your gains and you're locking them in with much smaller returns going forward, but the odds of loss is teensy tiny. So fantastic. 70 grand each is going to help you so much with your kid's college. Two quick things. That 529 guide is at clark.com slash 529. So that's easy to find. And then to transfer the money, just in case you don't know, you have to make a withdrawal from the covered L and then within 60 days, put that money into the 529. So you're not going to get a penalty there. Aaron in North Carolina says, I have personal advisor services with a personal advisor services account with Vanguard. Recently, I learned the advisor that I've been working with for the last seven years left them. I was assigned a new advisor. I have about 900,000 in IRA, Roth and brokerage accounts under management of this PAS. Should I use this time to shop with others, Fidelity and Schwab, or give it time with the new advisor? My wife and I are in our mid-50s and both of us work. I'm planning to work for another 10 years, my better half probably four more years. We have two teenagers, yes, we're late starters, and we have no debt except the mortgage and live below our means. What guidance would you give? All right, so first of all, if you're a late starter, Aaron, what am I? <laughs> Since I have a teenager and I'm 68, I oh will. Um, so I go back a step with you. Have you enjoyed the personal advisor services? The individual you were with is part of a culture at Vanguard. And if you liked the way that individual handled your money, but more importantly, you liked the culture of personal advisor services. Give the new person a chance because the fees at Vanguard are so ridiculously low for having a fiduciary financial planner available to you. If, on the other hand, you have not liked that much being with Vanguard, you're kind of like, yeah, it was okay. Uh, then, then I would use the transition time with the new advisor 
to go shop what you might find with going with Fidelity or Schwab. It's going to be a different kind of cultural experience with both of them. The fees will be higher with both of them than what you have with PAS. That's why if you have had a good experience with PAS culturally and with the individual you were with, I would give the new individual a chance to earn your trust. Renee in Florida says, my dad is 78 and he lives in New Jersey. He recently put solar panels on his home without my knowledge and said it was a government-backed program. From what I've read, there's a lot of these solar companies that prey on the elderly. Should I be concerned? Potentially, yes. The, you know, we've had so many complaints over the years that the uh, installation companies for residential solar have become the new used car salespeople. That we hear story after story, complaint after complaint. There are perfectly fine, decent operators in the business. It's also been an industry that seems to have attracted a lot of fly-by-night types. So it is partially true. New Jersey has uh, big incentives for people to put in solar panels. There are big federal incentives, but you're doing business with a private organization. People have done it so heavily in New Jersey because with the incentives, it's had a really nice payback for so many people in New Jersey to have solar panels. And you wouldn't think of New Jersey being in the north as being a big uh, solar install base, but it is. It has been a place that people have done it a lot. So you're asking two questions. One is, should you be concerned about your dad being taken advantage of about the solar, or I'm reading in between the lines, should, be you, should you be concerned about your dad? And the more you, and if you have siblings, know about what's going on with your dad, and the more nosy you get as a parent ages, even if they push back, the better it is to know what's going on with them. So this could be an early warning sign for you that your dad would be more susceptible to scams and con artists and things like this. Or it could be just the way solar is so often marketed. Could it be that, um, I know one of the bigger problems is if he's leasing them. Or oh. So I wonder oh, don't even get me into that. I should check into that. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. You want to make sure your dad did not sign a lease for solar. If he did at 78 years old, New Jersey may have an elder abuse statute. And these leases are usually extremely unfavorable, create a liability situation, and cause a problem in the event of your dad needing to go into assisted living, or he passes away. And uh, as an heir, you want to sell the property. You could have difficulty selling the property if it's in one of these hideous, disgusting, awful solar leases. So that would be, you'd want to see the paperwork that your dad signed. And if in fact, thank you, Krista, for reminding sure. me of that. If it was a solar lease, you want to find out from whatever the um, state agency's called on aging, whatever it is, it could be the state attorney general, you want to find out um, if this would qualify under elder abuse and you could get the transaction reversed and the solar removed because you do not want leased panels on a roof. I don't care what your age is, you don't want leased panels on your roof. Coming up ahead, diamonds, a deal? Seriously? Well, I'm going to tell you that the diamond market is changing in multiple ways to your advantage. I got great news for you if you like diamonds, love diamonds. The cost of diamonds goes up and down like oil does or any other commodity. But the diamond market has some very unusual wrinkles going on you need to know. Uh, diamond costs for traditional diamonds, dug out of the earth diamonds, the cost is down by about a quarter from where it was just a year ago. So diamond prices for traditional dug out of the earth are 
much more favorable than they were if you shop around. The second thing is if you've listened to me for a long time, you know I have my obsession with lab-created diamonds, factory-produced diamonds that chemically are identical to ones dug out of the earth. They're essentially clones of dug out of the earth diamonds. And that market is now accounting for close to 40% of the diamond market. And they are chemically identical. So now if you buy a lab created diamond, it should have a marking on it that you can see under a jeweler can see under a scope that shows it was, that it was in fact lab created, factory created. But to the naked eye, they are identical. But the great news is this type of diamond that is now 40% of the market, okay, the price of those has fallen in half in basically the last three years. Because there's enormous economies of scale with producing a diamond in a factory versus one that somebody's having to dig out of the earth. In theory, there is a finite supply that can be dug out of the earth with the danger to the miners, uh, the risks involved in that, and for people that are into that whole blood, uh, what they call them, blood diamonds, where they feel like there's exploitation uh, for a number of reasons, buying lab-created is a double benefit because you don't have to worry about that. And there's a, not a finite supply. There's basically an infinite supply of diamonds that can be created in a factory. And so the prices of those are going down, down, down. And so what's amazing is a one carat ultra high quality diamond when you buy lab created, is now one third the cost, one third the cost for a one carat diamond for an engagement ring of what a dug out of the earth one is. And let me tell you, you look at them, you cannot tell a difference other than that probably the lab created diamond is going to be better. So this is a massive change where the deals are extraordinary, but the best deals or if you want to think of it this way, if you have a budget for a diamond and you're going to buy one size that you had in your mind of a dug out of the earth diamond and you want to use the same budget, you will be able to get a far, far, far larger stone of the same quality for the same price. So either you can look at it as you're spending much less money on the size and quality diamond you were thinking of buying by buying lab created or you can spend the same money and get a ginormo diamond your choice a lot of traditionalist jewelers were extremely hostile to the lab created and now you know marketplace speaks now they're generally not so hostile i remember years ago I was having a bagel with friends and an owner of a jewelry store came up to me and started screaming at me about trying to sell people these counterfeit diamonds. Well, <laughs> this jewelry store now advertises lab created diamonds. So what happens is if I'm a good capitalist, I adapt to the marketplace and the marketplace has changed. If I'm a smart consumer, I adapt to the change in the marketplace and save my money. Krista? Meredith in North Carolina says, is it legal for a business to sell gift cards that expire after one year? I read that in 2009, a new federal law states that gift cards could not expire for five years. It is not legal. I know of no circumstance today where a gift card can expire sunset in one year um, a local business may not be aware of the law and may be selling one with an early sunset but it's clearly not permitted and in fact most states 
have laws that predate the federal law that give you much more than one year anyway to redeem a gift card. Kimberly in Ohio says, my significant other of 10 years and I are debt free and own our cars and house. Before I knew him, yes, before I knew him, he had a bankruptcy in 2010 as a builder during the housing crisis. Since then, he's only used a debit card. After listening to your podcast, I convinced him to get a credit card. He was denied. I have a Chase Sapphire Preferred, and I put him on as an authorized user. I heard you say that this will help build his credit. I'm confused on how this works. Chase did not ask for his social security number when I requested the card. How can this build his credit if all they have is his name and address? Very good thinking. It will not help him. You have to contact Chase back and provide his social security number because then you're lending him your good credit history, your good credit name, and it will establish him with some current credit. And if you have a second card, you can also have him named as an authorized user from a different issuer other than Chase, the combination of the two cards should give him the good on-ramp to be able to get his own credit card. I would say within 90 days of you having established him with that social security number with Chase, a second card, the best thing to do would be not to apply for a mass market card, but potentially look at a credit card from a credit union that I hope you're both members of as a way to get a card. Otherwise, have him set up a Credit Karma account. Credit Karma will track his credit standing, and then they use artificial intelligence and whatever proprietary methods. They will show over time as they track his credit score what cards he has high likelihood of being approved for, a mediocre likelihood, and basically no likelihood. And they get a commission if you end up applying through their portal, but they will be able, without taking a hard hit against the credit, be able to tell you if it says uh, great likelihood or whatever they call that, then odds are overwhelming he'll be approved for a card. Natalie in Ohio says, I recently moved into a new apartment and I've noticed something odd that I've never seen before when I go to pay my rent. Every time I pay online, I'm asked if I want to start having my rent payments reported to the credit bureaus to improve my credit score. I always decline because I already have excellent credit, but is this something I should actually be opting into? Yeah, you don't need to do it. Uh, There's been so much conversation about how so many people are basically unbanked for credit, and so they are denied because they have no history. So there's more and more... um, computer models that show how somebody pays their utility bills, how they pay their rent, how they pay various non-credit regular occurring expenses are a very solid model of how they'll do with credit. So it is something that has gone from being just like a a pointy-headed kind of study kind of thing to now becoming part of credit granting decisions. So in your case, no value, but for people who have no credit, what are known as extended credit scores, is what they're generically referred to, are something that more credit granters are using than used to, and it's something that's gaining acceptance in the financial industry. So for people who are given that opportunity, you don't have credit, or had a history of bad credit, having your rent payments, utility payments, cell phone payments, things like that tracked can lead you back to a path of being able to obtain traditional credit. Mike in Idaho says, can I get an update on the free tele TV program? I reserved my TV months ago and have heard nothing. Yeah, so this is the 55 inch free TV, right? And I have the tele app. They rejected me because you have to say it will be your primary TV. That's one of the terms of service. And I was just doing it to test for you and your fellow listener. And so I'm, I can't give you any sense of what's going on. We had some uh, members of Team Clark, Clark.com. They've signed up and they haven't heard anything. They haven't heard either. anything either. 
So this may be uh, something that is slow getting off the ground or may do a, a belly flop or face plant. So that's why we're testing it as well. And so we've got nothing to report yet, but so far um, there's nothing for you to watch. There's no TV for you to get. So um, as soon as we know something, we'll post it on Clark.com and we'll give an update on the podcast. And if anybody else signed up for telly and you got your TV, please let us know that at least somebody has gotten that TV. And that does it for us today. And know this about televisions. They're so cheap right now. If you do have to buy one, it'll feel like it's almost free. Cheapest month of the year to buy TVs, the month of November is when you buy a television. They're usually last season models. They're usually third tier models, but they are cheap. So, and Clark Deals has a whole category of televisions. They are watching prices all the time. And they're, they don't pay, post just the rock gut cheap ones like I buy. They post like real brand names I couldn't care about. But you can buy either the rock gut cheap or you can buy the brand name of whatever size you're interested in. The best deals lately have been 75-inch TVs, which recently I've seen at $599 and $699. And if you want a ginormo TV, I That's saw... That's not ginormo? <laughs> no, 85-inch is the ginormo oh. size now. I saw a sale recently for an 85-inch for $800. $49. How's that? Think about that. What did Lane You say? don't have to worry if the field goal kicker kicked it through the goal post. You will see it clear as could be during football season. What did Lane say? I got an 85 You did? Nice. From Costco. I paid more because Best Buy had the one for $849, and the reviews were mediocre as I read them. And then Costco had one for $9.99, and it was an off-brand. Um, but the picture is extraordinary, and now I'm ready for football season with my 85-inch TV for $999. Because, you know, football is... Your life. Football is my life. That does it for us today. Remember what we're about, though. Save more. Spend less and avoid getting ripped off.